outcome is not a guarantee at all and it's not in your hands and if you constantly tell children that it is the outcome that is directly associated with their capability then if they don't achieve outcome they're going to question their capability in its entirety welcome to another edition of contra minds in this episode we have a very distinguished guest one of india's foremost neuroscientists professor vidita vaidya Professor Vidita Vaidya teaches at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research Mumbai. Professor Vidita Vaidya received her undergraduate degree from St Xavier's College in Life Sciences and Biochemistry. She obtained her doctoral degree in neuroscience from Yale University. Her postdoctoral work was done at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden and at the University of Oxford, UK. She received the prestigious Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Prize in 2015 which is one of India's foremost awards in the science and technology category over to my conversation with professor Vidita Vaidya thank you professor uh, Vidita Vaidya uh, for taking time and joining me in my conversation today thanks swami i look forward to our chat i am quite amazed with the body of work and research that you have done especially in the neuro circuitry of emotion and uh, the uh, impact of the circuits with respect to uh, depression and things like that i wanted to first before talking about all that first talk to you about your early years your parents are also clinical scientists they have been a big motivation for you talk to me about that Yeah so I grew up uh, in Goregaon on a research center campus in those days there really wasn't we're talking about the 1970s and there was RA Mill colony there was Sibagai ki campus in Goregaon and there really wasn't much else there was film city also sort of around the corner but it was pretty green and lush and a remarkably beautiful part of uh, of Bombay city and it was a research center campus that I grew up on so I was surrounded by a lot of research scientists chemists biologists physiologists pharmacologists uh, and it was a medical research sort of pharmacological drug discovery research center campus but it was a rather a sort of a you know in that sense a very idyllic existence growing up in a city like mumbai when you had that degree of greenery and you know so many trees and plants and animals and we actually had like panthers sometimes would wander in from um, you know from across just the sanjay gandhi national park so it was not unheard of to be told okay please be careful this week because you know we've had a few sightings that was not at all uh, unusual so it was a rather i mean not an urban childhood in the classical sense so i this is where i grew up and my parents my mother and father are both md phd's my father is a clinical pharmacologist my mother is an endocrinologist so uh, but the household because my grandparents lived with us as well so it was a joint family and my grandfather is a freedom fighter who went to jail with gandhi ji um you know was an mp in gujarat in the first first sort of government post independence and is also a novelist and writer so as a consequence a lot of the table conversations were quite diverse it went from you know biology to sort of philosophy to literature to it was it was a wide spectrum so yeah it was a it was a very special um, childhood that i cherish immensely no question about it yeah you were also inspired by the work of scientists and educators such as Diane Fossey and Jane Goodall tell me a little bit about that yeah so actually i didn't get introduced to them till a little later what happened was we used to have so you know this imagine the, this is the 70s none of us have television we don't have air conditioners in our rooms it's not like the era of kids growing up today right so every wednesday we used to have a seminar series that was held in the campus beautiful auditorium which was air conditioned and as you can see the air conditioning part was quite an important part for a young child because the idea of going into that cold room and sitting on the floor while you listen to different talks was rather magical and special and we used to have talks from many visiting scientists who used to come from all over the world and they would come and give a broad sort of public lecture so i remember one lecture in fact the rest of the lectures i cannot even remember 
we used to also have like Laurel and Hardy and Charlie Chaplin movie screenings in that auditorium. So it was a very, very nice magical space growing up as a kid because none of us had TVs at home. So this was a treat to get to watch on a big screen and sit in that cold room. But this lecture I has has just stayed sort of emblazoned in my mind because it was by these this couple. Two of them were researching behavior of hippopotamuses in the wild. And they were actually looking at aggressive behavior of male hippopotamuses towards each other. And, you know, they, when they, the talk started, initially it was technical, but after that they started playing videos of their travels in Africa. And I think that was my first, oh my gosh, people actually do things like this. And uh, then I read about Diane, about Jane Goodall and, you know, British Council Library in those days, because that was what our access was. Or you... Eventually, when you had a sort of, you would borrow tapes, could actually watch David Attenborough watching these. This was just, that was part of that childhood era. So I was absolutely blown away by these women who were doing these incredible things out in the wild. Professor Vidita Vaidya, you went to Xavier's, then you went to Yale, then you went to the Karolinska Institute, you went to University of Oxford. The learning experience in each of these institutions uh, must be very, very different for you. Talk to me about that. So I remember when I was in my 11th and 12th, which was actually at Ruya College in Mumbai. And then I, uh, you know, at that point in time, I was surrounded by everybody who wanted to do either medicine or engineering. And it was really a, it was a shock to any of them that I was seriously considering doing a BSc in life science and biochemistry because that was the sort of last ditch option that anybody took. Nobody uh, wanted to go in for the, those BSc degrees at that time. And uh, so I remember being like told by a lot of people, including, you know, friends of my parents saying, why would you not take medicine and why would you not choose it? But I remember being very excited about the life science biochemistry program at Xavier's. And it was rather unique and special because it was very broad based and it's quite different from what we often see today in biotechnology programs, which are very narrow relatively in comparison. So it was a very broad based biology degree and people from there have gone on to do really a variety of diverse things. So I thoroughly enjoyed my three years at Xavier's and right after that, when it was time to apply to graduate school, I was being very uh, sort of hesitant to apply to the bigger name universities because I felt like you know as a young student in India three years here I have no research experience why would any of these bigger universities even potentially look at my application seriously I didn't want to waste any money on those applications those days with our sort of exchange rate it was actually quite prohibitive to apply so I I told my dad I'm not going to apply to you know the fancier name universities or even though I found their programs very interesting and this is the piece of advice that I would love to share with younger people when they are making these sorts of decisions. And my dad said, why don't you at least give them the opportunity to reject you? You have just decided in your own mind to reject yourself and say you're not good enough. But at least give them the option. No, they'll, if they reject you, you deal with it. It's okay. It's not the end of the world. But not even applying and not even trying is not, not a great idea. So because he said that, I literally applied. And I must say I was... Uh, absolutely gobsmacked and shocked that I got in, right? So I wasn't expecting that. And I also remember my first semester in graduate school where I did feel a little bit thrown in at the deep end, partly because I hadn't done any experimental neuroscience then till then at all. And so I was, the, the learning curve was very, very steep. And it was also different because it was far less content based and far more conceptual in its manner of um, you know approaching any idea so you weren't expected to retain information as much as they were very interested in how you would approach a question or how you would resolve or look at a problem and it took a while to transition from a more traditional uh, let's try to see how much you can retain in terms of information system to this you know more conceptual approach but once you get excited and find that interesting, you realize that actually information is always at your fingertips. You can find it. It is this other approach, which is how will you look at a problem from a lateral point of view in a unique manner? That is a form of training that you really benefit from. And that's what I thoroughly enjoyed my five years at Yale. I also had amazing, amazing mentors. 
um, you know, both my my PhD advisor, Ronald Duman, and another mentor, Eric Nestler, uh, Marina Picciotto, and Amy Anston. These are people who just literally had my back for those five years. And, you know, it was, it was a it was remarkable to see what mentorship can be when someone invests you in uh, invests in you in that manner. And so I think that's the if you ask me what's the educational piece that I most cherish in my entire educational journey, it will be my five years at Yale because I really met remarkable people and was really blessed to work with some amazing individuals. How was the learning environment and pedagogy different at Yale versus European schools such as Oxford and the Karolinska Institute? Yeah, I did, but I think it's also not a like direct to direct comparison because by the time I was in Sweden and at the University of Oxford, I had already uh, graduated with my PhD. So I already had my PhD. So I wasn't really in a classroom situation anymore, even though even in a PhD at Yale, it was just the first two years that was more traditional pedagogic learning. The rest of it, you're laboratory doing experiments. But the year I spent at Sweden and the two years I spent at Oxford, yes, it is quite different. Oxford has a deep tradition and you see that tradition, it seeps into many, many dimensions. And there are many advantages to it because there are um, patterns of learning that are old and have been around for a while. But it also means that you have to fit in more into that environment, whereas the U.S. tended to be more of a melting pot in a sense that there was just a bit, I felt there was a bit more diversity of thought and ways of looking at things. It was just a little bit younger and the energy of the place was different, definitely. I'm biased. I do definitely say that that was my most, uh, you know, cherished educational experience. Sweden, I, I mean, I love the lab. I, I love the people I was working with. I also really enjoyed the people at Oxford, but Sweden was too cold for me. The dark light uh, fluctuations was enough to do this Bombay girl in. I was like, how can people live with no light for, you know, I mean, it was really, it was a struggle. I really had a hard time with that cold and that darkness. I, I can understand that it is a real sort of cultural and, you know, sort of environmental adjustment you actually have to make. So what brought you to TIFR? So I wanted to come back home entirely the entire way. Okay, so there was never a where are you going to live question in my line, mind at all. I mean, I knew that I definitely wanted to come back home. That was clear to me. I knew that I wanted a faculty position and I wanted to do it at a good institution in the country. And at the time I was applying, which is now 1999, there were just a handful of institutions in the country that did vertebrate neuroscience, you know, of any real significant extent and depth. And so I knew I only had a handful of institutions to apply to. It was not like I was going to apply the length and breadth of the country. And of course, I was biased to Mumbai. I am a Bombay kid. I grew up here. My parents are here. My in-laws are here. We just wanted to come back home to this, this environment. So it was very clear that this is home. So certainly the focus was very much on coming back to TIFR if I could. Um, I didn't apply to too many other places, but I had a very stated preference that I prefer coming back to Mumbai. And that's what I was lucky to get that position. I think I was just one of the sort of the earliest team of people who began to come back at that point in time. So where is this interest of study of emotions start and how did you get into it? So I remember being interested in behavior. Where do individual differences in behavior arise? And if you ask yourself, what's the organ in the body that produces behavioral states? You know, it's the brain. Now, when you think about behavior, you, I mean, we often think about behavior, we automatically think of our own behavior. And as I sort of went along early years of my PhD, I began to get most interested in the kind of behaviors that could be clubbed under, under the umbrella of emotional behaviors. And that there are some of these behaviors are very, very conserved. So one example I'll give you is fear. Seen up and down the evolutionary ladder, right? It's a survival instinct. We all need fear as a behavioral response because it prevents us from doing things which are truly foolhardy sometimes in a sense, right? We learn to fear certain situations, to fear certain concepts. And that's a survival requirement, survival adaptive advantage. 
So I was interested in the idea that you can actually study the circuits in the brain that can produce fear. But then when fear is wrongly evoked, eventually a failure of these circuits causes anxiety. Now, anxiety could be genuinely because there is a situation that is really uh, anxiogenic. It's genuinely making you anxious. But sometimes you can also have anxiety when there's really no obvious cause. And that I began to find interesting that these are such adaptive behaviors and we all have them and we require them and yet they can go completely haywire. And when they go haywire, you have psychiatric disorders like anxiety, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, panic disorder, schizophrenia. So the spectrum of psychiatric disorders. So it was really early on in my PhD that I knew I wanted to work on the spectrum of behaviors that really in many ways are the kind of behaviors that are associated with dysfunction, associated with psychiatric disorders. But I also knew I wanted to do this in rats and mice, right? I wanted to study the circuits. I was not going to be doing this in humans. I actually needed to study the behavioral behavioral outputs in animal models. And that requires a fair, you cannot ask an animal, are you anxious? That's not an available option, right? What you can do is you can measure how an animal would behave in a situation in which perhaps a fear or a conflict, et cetera, is generated. And that allows you to do behavioral tasks which you can actually measure their behavior. Yeah. But it was a pretty early interest, well, in in sort of the early part of my PhD. Tell me a little bit about your lab, the research work that you do there, and specifically the role of, you know, serotonin in shaping neurocircuits and stress and control of life experiences. So if I was to summarize everything that we do in my lab, and there are many different diverse projects, but literally if I had to give like the elevator pitch, right? I meet you in a lift. You ask me, what do you do? I have two minutes before you get out of the lift and I give you the elevator pitch. I would say that we are interested in asking how experience shapes these circuits that regulate emotional behavior, life experience. How does life experience actually modify these circuits and change behavior? So that's one question. And the second question is how do drugs that are actually used to treat these disorders, so antidepressants, anxiolytics, drugs that are used to reduce anxiety, psychedelic drugs, which are actually hallucinogenic drugs, but can also have very robust behavioral effects. How do they influence these circuits to actually change the behavior? So it's really a two-pronged approach. We're looking at how life experience and how treatments impinge on these circuits to change the way the circuits function, right? Now, central, I mean, there are many ways you can probe this, but central to this is also to ask, are there specific pathways one is particularly interested in? And many people choose their favorite pathway. I am particularly interested in the monoamine serotonin. It's an evolutionarily conserved molecule its evolutionary history is greater than three billion years ago so it's really old it's there in you know from the earliest stages of multicellular organisms so multicellularity and the presence of serotonin right there at the very earliest stages of archaea etc there in mollusks so it's there long before even neurons appear It's there long before a nervous system and a brain as we recognize it appears. And the receptors for serotonin don't show up till around 760 million years ago. So that just gives you the sort of, but these are evolutionarily old systems, right? And serotonin is, we know, targeted both by life experience and both by drugs that treat depression and anxiety and schizophrenia. So we're very interested in this particular neurotransmitter, how it works, how is it co-opted? In a sense, what we're asking is, is life experience actually co-opting or modulating this pathway to change the circuits and drugs? For example, let's take a drug like Prozac, which uh, made Eli Lilly very, very wealthy, but is essentially an antidepressant that has been extensively used. It elevates levels of serotonin in the brain. And so that's the two-pronged approach that we use. But that sort of broadly summarizes most of the work in my lab. How do you take that research and apply it to real life? You study it on mice and rats. How do you really take the learnings back into the real world? So we don't. 
we would def- define ourselves as fundamental research, basic research biologists. And the sort of work I do is basic behavioral neuropsychopharmacology. But the, the way you can think about this is this is a pipeline, right? And there are people working at different levels. So I happen to work with rats and mice. There are people who work with monkeys. There are people who work directly with humans. There are people who work with neurons that are derived from cells and stem cells that are taken from humans and grown in vitro. So you have multiple people in this pipeline. And this pipeline is not such that you're not talking to each other because the community as a whole is sharing their science collectively with each other. And we are very influenced, not just by work that's done in humans, but also the reverse way, work done in rodents, informs work that is actually then being applied to the human situation. Plus, especially when we work with drugs, some of these are experimental drugs that are not even currently potential therapy-like modules, right? They're not, they're not out there as therapies. And that becomes quite interesting to um, sort of the pipeline of the pharma industry. And so you can then have sort of these collaborations and dialogue with that pipeline as well. And leads get picked up from there to actually go into a more translational mode. So what I think I would say is what we do has translational implications. Does it immediately translate? No, it's dependent on the pipeline to eventually get translated to the human. But that's pretty much how most drug discovery or therapeutic work goes. And very often, the application component being people who directly are medical doctors working with patients or the pharma industry depend, depend, you know, developing a molecule. But the, the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine is a great example of this. If you actually think about the research that started this vaccine, it started in a very basic research lab at Penn, right, at UPenn. The mRNA vaccine idea is really coming in initially from a basic science lab, and then it translates. But these things take time. It's 15 years, sometimes it's 10 years, sometimes it's 20 years. So I would say I'm at the very beginning end of that pipeline, not at the other sort of end that actually results in the translation. I saw you talk about the lifestyle disorders being the next biggest reason for causing deaths. And some of your studies of the brain, the emotion, the life experiences are so critical in this lifestyle disorders. Uh, Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Yeah. So if you think about, let's say we were 100 years ago, of course, we wouldn't be having a podcast 100 years back. But let's imagine we were talking to each other 100 years ago, right? About 100 years ago, we would have been talking about, oh, no, there's going to be, you know, that we have to, at that point in time, we would have been talking about Spanish influenza. So we'd be talking about, it wouldn't be unusual to have heard about a plague epidemic somewhere. It would not be unusual at all to be talking about cholera and dysentery. And, you know, there, if you look at infectious diseases and the infectious disease burden, and if you look at the way people were dying in the first sort of, 50 years from 1900 to 1950, if you look at that window, you can actually see the life expectancy 50, 60 was a very great life expectancy. People are like, oh, that's really good. Somebody's lived a full life. Now we will say, oh, no, the person died rather young because, because something dramatically changed. And it's really a remarkable biomedical intervention. So if you just think about the advent of antibiotics, As simple as that, right? The discovery of penicillin, the application of antibiotics to bacterial infections, which could kill you in the past. But now we don't even think about it. We will say, oh, yeah, this can be treated. So absolutely, biomedical science handled a very large chunk of infectious diseases and took it off the table. We will never think about somebody getting polio anymore. And yet it was a serious, we know at least our age group knows people who had polio. But our children will not even identify with the idea of somebody who had polio because it's not part of their vocabulary anymore. Smallpox, again, we saw people with smallpox lesions. Our generation has grown up with that. Their generation has no clue what a smallpox lesion looks like. It just isn't even in there because the vaccine, you know, took care of it and and the virus is eliminated, doesn't exist anywhere on the globe. So when you think about that, and now you say, okay, 100 years later, today, what are we talking about? We're talking about heart attack. We're talking about stroke. We're talking about cancer. We're talking about chronic disorders that emerge very often in a slow manner. 
and our cumulative burden may be a component of it being stress but also a variety of other components of lifestyle by the way psychiatric disorders fall into that list in terms of health burden you know by 2020 the who estimate was it was going to be one of the second leading causes of of serious morbidity right so it is true i mean anxiety depression schizophrenia ocd serious serious disease burden there and so in a sense what you can say our work does is because we in, are interested in how life experiences change the brain and we are also interested in how life experiences change our ability to handle and respond to stress in particular we are really looking at what makes you vulnerable and what makes you resilient because it turns out that it's not as though i mean yes there is a component of genetic capability both for vulnerability and for resilience but there's a massive huge component of environment that will determine whether you will be able to buffer stress or you will be excessively vulnerable to it and that's what we are very interested in asking why does this happen right i mean we work with genetically inbred mouse models we are reducing genetic variability so we are really looking at the big impact of environment and we can see a huge impact of environment with a disproportionate influence of early environment not the environment you see in adulthood but the kind of environment you saw as a baby or as an adolescent that window seems to be most critical so talk to me a little bit about that uh, the early life experiences in fact one of your research studies talks about really you know using that study to talk about the first 10 15 years of how this experience has lifetime implications on how you handle emotion how do you handle stress and how the importance of care has right. an impact on the brain right so you know here's a good example of how we can get inspired by what is known clinically and then there's a back and forth between the preclinical and the clinical so it's not surprising and lots of epidemiological studies have shown that if you look for a common risk factor what are common risk for factors for anxiety depression schizophrenia um substance abuse where are let's look for common risk factors one of the most common risk factors is early life trauma and early life adversity early life stress okay this is common it doesn't matter which psychiatric disorder you're looking at all of them hold in common this early life trauma like history it's a risk factor it's not a guarantee so don't walk away thinking that everyone who goes through trauma is automatically going to go ahead and get some psychiatric disorder not at all but what it does tell you is that your risk enhances sub- substantially when you have this early life adversity so this is known clinically for quite some time and the community of people who are like me right who are basic neurobiologists have been wanting to understand what actually changes in the brain what's really changing when these animals are going through altered sort of life history in the early window so we use a model um, of neglect right now what do i mean by neglect the animals are not nutritionally deprived they're getting their food so they're putting on weight etc there all that is happening but the amount of nurture they actually see and you can actually measure the number of nursing bouts the number of times the dam sits on top of the pups and you know licks them and grooms them and nurtures sort of stimulation which is tactile right so touch related stimulation and that seems to be extremely critical so if that gets fragmented and the quality of that deteriorates and please be aware that the species i work with it is largely the mother but if you take another species it is the mother and the father right so it's both and when you move to primates who are much closer to us then it's even more complex it's not just mother and father it's mother father aunts uncles there's a community so there is a nurturing community that comes to play it's not just one individual but for the species i work with it really is much more just the mother it's just that equation and if the quality of care deteriorates then you look at these so now then you let these animals grow up and you run them on a battery of behavioral tasks and what you will find is they sh- they show perturbed fear responses their stress hormonal pathways have gone haywire their ability to control their stress response has gone haywire the hormonal stress response as well as other signatures of stress responses they show changes in their gut 
And in fact, it's a model of irritable bowel syndrome as well, telling you that it's not just the brain. There are broader effects. There can be effects seen in, in the gut, in the periphery. Their immune system responses are not normal. So what has happened is a consequence of this perturbation, which was relatively not so severe. It's just that there was not perhaps the best quality of nurture in that early window. You will see very persistent effects. In fact, we have looked out till 18 months, which is actually a middle-aged rat or a middle-aged mouse. That's really quite old, right? For the lifespan of rats and mice is two, two and a half years. So this 18 months is pretty old. We're looking at the older end. And you can see that these effects are so clear cut that 18 months later, when you're looking at the brain or you're looking at behavior, you can say, aha, these animals had a disrupted early stress history. So the, the sort of the marks associated with this persist almost across the entire lifespan. And that is a little unnerving in a sense to think that that early window, because you can do stress in adulthood. You can take an adult animal and give it a variety of stressors and the effects are usually short-lived. Yeah, the animal goes to stress, but after the stress stops, it comes back to normal. You know, it, it more often than not, it reverts right back to its baseline. But not when the stress is when the animals are in this window called a critical period. And that's why it's so interesting, because even humans have critical periods. And perhaps the best way I can demonstrate a critical period is if I tell you, Swami, I think you should go learn two, three new languages, right? You will tell me, Vidita, no, this is not a great idea. I will try very hard, but I'm very unlikely to learn three, four new languages. Maybe I take your grandchild, okay? If you have a grandchild or you have a young niece or nephew, someone who's under 10. And I tell this kid, you know what? I want you to play around with four or five different families, all of whom speak different languages. I bet you after some time, this child will start getting fluency in a variety of languages. There is a reason why. There is a critical period for language learning. And that is that early first 10 years. So if you have learned, I bet you're my, um, bilingual, right, Swami? You speak yeah, multiple yeah. languages. Most I'm of sorry. our Indians are bilingual, multilingual. And we find it very easy to switch from one language to another because we think in many languages. And this multilinguality is actually a really good plasticity advantage for the brain. But if we were to try and acquire a whole bunch of new languages, we will struggle. It will not be straightforward. And so just like there is a critical period for learning something, there are also critical periods for stress responses. In a sense, the brain is predicting the kind of environment it will see when this animal becomes an adult. So the animal sees a very stressful environment. It's almost as though the system is saying, oh my God, I'm going to always see a lot of stress. So I better have a hyper vigilant, hyper primed, excessively active stress response pathway. And then what happens is the following. So imagine a situation. I'll give you an example. So this system is beautiful because it evolved. Our stress response systems evolved beautifully when we were wandering around in the savanna, etc. Right. Imagine that our ancestors were out there. You need to run away if somebody's trying to catch you. And so certainly the stress response pathway is very useful then. You need to, you know, mobilize glucose to your muscle. You need to switch off digestion, switch off reproduction, you know, really reorient your system and hopefully you escape. Even if you're trying to catch your food and your food is something that is moving, I mean, it could be an animal, then to run after it and catch it and all again is a stress response path. But these are all short-lived quick, tiny, so short duration, either you run away, you catch it, something happens, it terminates. The system is beautifully designed for that. Now, why are we switching it on? Let's say you have a fight with your boss or rather you have a disagreement with your boss. You come home. Now, the weekend is there. You have a chance to play with your child. You have a chance to do something else. Maybe you can watch a movie, make you cook a nice meal but your mind is constantly preoccupied with this argument you had on Friday and you are just destroying your current moment thinking about this. But you know what your body is doing? Your body is secreting the exact same hormones it would have secreted if you were running away from a tiger or running after something. So stress response pathway is conserved. It hasn't changed. Except this is going to go on constantly. 
And if you have to work with this person for months and months, you are going to bathe your body with sustained stress hormones for long periods of time. What seems to be true is individuals who had early adversity have particularly higher degree of challenge modulating their stress response and controlling it and shutting it off. So as important as it is to switch on a stress response, it's equally important to switch it off. So that was a very long-winded answer, but hopefully that gives you a sense of why those early windows matter so much. Very interesting. Most importantly, the early life syndrome that you spoke about has a huge implication on the entire life of you know how somebody copes with stress. It could be your family, it could be your work-related stress. So what are the best ways of building stress coping pathways? What are the frameworks and the architecture? You, you have written about the stress architecture itself. So what are the stress coping pathways one can build? Because the adversity is long done and gone. How do you really build your stress control pathways? So I'm first going to talk about it in terms of prevention. And then we're going to talk in terms of treatment because prevention is going to do way more better than any treatment is going to. And I'm going to just give you the bad news that prevention is really the best way out. Why do I say this? Because if you think about our own country, we are a lopsided country in terms of youth. We have a young population. We're a young country. So if you look at our pyramid, we have a really big, wide base. We have so many people under the age of 25. 25, till 25, your prefrontal cortex is, there's a fair bit of really protracted development still going on in terms of organizing the circuitry in the brain, right? But the first window, the really critical first window is the first 10 years, what you do right in that first 10 years is going to hold you in good stead for the next 70, right? Now, yes, you can attempt to try to repair the consequences of what went wrong in the first 10, and I'll come to that. But I would say as a society, as a country, as a country with this sort of a young population, our first goal should be to provide for that pyramid being protected by being given the right things in that window. And then the absolute basics are, of course, nutrition, education, access to healthcare, right? Three pillars. I'm not even going to, I'm, I know I'm talking to a slightly more privileged audience. The idea is without that, it is almost pointless having these discussions. The nutrition is not on the table. Then really, what are we talking about? Nurture and care and all of that is, yes, it's wonderful, but nutrition is is a key building block and it's absolutely essential for the brain to develop appropriately. So poverty is itself a massive stress. You know, it is a massive stress and a massive disadvantage in some ways. And so as a country, when we look at that window, when you think about midday meal programs, when you think about providing government-based educational programs and access to health care, etc., it's a critical place to invest. Because you can build all the roads and you can build all the infrastructure. If you do not build your human capital, you will have all that, but you will not have what it really requires. That's what's going to shape our country going forward, right? So really investment in nutrition, investment in healthcare, and investment in education. These are the three pillars. And we have to do that right. And that's why I'm saying prevention is, is the bigger piece. We need to get public healthcare in place we need to get basic governmental education so that right to education is available for all children of this country. And we have to provide nutrition of a certain caliber and quality when there is challenges in terms of being able to access that kind of nutrition. It has to come through government-aided programs, and that has to be an investment area. I know we talk about defense as an investment area, but you know this, in my opinion, would be the place to really look at long term that you will reap the benefits if you do this investment right. And you will reap the benefits going forward for decades and decades if you do this right. So to me, that's the first piece. Now, let's say those pillars are in place. If those pillars are in place, that means a child who has ac access to nutrition, access to health care, has got their vaccines, has the basic things and pillars are in place. What is the next level? Now I'm talking about psychological. Those were physical stresses and physical issues, but psychological stressors. 
if there are stressors along the lines that are associated with performance continuous requirement to get people to get into kindergarten first standard 10th standard exams standard exams if you look at the burden you are putting on under 10 under 15 year olds i would give you an example of the iit entrance exam if for two years you're putting people into coaching classes with a with a frenetic pace you're just killing creativity i'm not sure you will end up with a ton of creative enterprise at the end of it you may have a bunch of people who have been to perform but you have lost all creative advantage in the process so i i mean i think it's really interesting that we have a national education policy much of it much of it has really interesting things in place but our problem in our country has never been our policies it has always been our implementation so the question is that's going to be the critical part right now i mean these are broader ideas at the level of government state government institutions etc what about for the individual what about for you me aunts uncles grandparents etc i'll tell you something that goes really a long way every child needs somebody who believes in them unconditionally just unconditionally believes in their true potential to flower at something or the other whatever that may be right so you need people in your corner who are backing you because yes stresses will come but if you have a robust sense of your self worth it really does protect and now i'm using an a major extrapolation from what we do in rodents and rats and mice models but i'll tell you something um there's enough data to indicate that high quality nurture even in rats and mice right you can actually look at high quality nurture and you look at these animals when they become adult they're far less likely to show anxiety and despair like behavior their fear responses are beautifully modulated they show altered cognitive ability so that happens their inflammatory responses are far tighter regulated and controlled they really have a massive fighting advantage now how much of this is true for humans the strong reason to believe it is indeed true from work done by psychologists work done by psychiatrists there are many things each of us can do i mean let's say you work in a you know you live in a building in a society and you build all the parking lots and you leave no place for your children to play so you have 2 2 3 3 cars per building and they're all parked and then if kids go down and play with a cricket ball and they break a window or they break a glass so you yell at them because you've essentially taken away all free play all room for stress busters i think there's a role for each of us to play as a citizen as a parent as an aunt uncle friend need more nurturing environments to that under 10 under 15 year old pool and to do it consciously so it's not just something you default to but you're consciously asking yourself what am i doing as a citizen to contribute to that age group that i have contact with right so i do think there is a, a role for each of us to play in that window and and the consequences of this will be deep and long lasting because like i said when you move to primates away from rodents it moves to a society it's no longer mother and father much the same way for the human right it is aunt uncle mother father siblings grandparents teachers you know building auntie somebody down the road it's your sports teacher it is multiple people and each of those people is bringing something to bear so it's a much more complex situation but the data strongly indicate that quality of care nurture a minimal stressful environment and when i say a minimal stressful environment but don't do it in a manner which uh, you know makes the child totally lose their sense of fun and play in any learning process so yeah so india is a large middle class population and uh, we know the kind of stress the kids go through given the fact that in fact you said early in our chat that you either do medical or engineering and you know you put them through that kind of stress at the same time you also talked about the conceptual learning that ail gave you so right. how do you build that nurture environment in a middle class environment in india where it's so competitive out there 
it's a it's a real issue that i see today because when you know somebody does not get into iit somebody does not go to harvard somebody does not join columbia you pretty much then start saying that oh you are not successful so how do you how does the brain really get affected by all this right so i think it's critical to remember that you cannot be outcome oriented you have to be process oriented so if you start off by saying my goal post is to go to x university or y university you have already decided that that's your goal and it may or may not happen there's a very strong possibility that when thousands and hundreds and lakhs of children are applying so you know it's a difference between half a mark and one mark and two marks and that's going to determine whether you get in or not it's not your capability that's being tested it's the luck on that particular day whether you know you were distracted by a helicopter that was flying outside it's a, a bunch of arbitrary reasons that can switch you know one situation to the other it's really not testing for capability it's testing for some sort of performance under a very controlled kind of pressure environment i understand that we think about outcomes first because we want as a community to ensure that our children will be secure right we are saying i want my child to have a stable job i want them to be able to do well raise a family so with each generator generation you are looking for something to improve in the next generation now part of the problem with being so outcome oriented is the outcome is not a guarantee at all and it's not in your hands and if you constantly tell children that it is the outcome that is directly associated with their capability then if they don't achieve outcome they're going to question their capability in its entirety whereas if you say process oriented which is what you child wants to be an engineer are you telling me that the child cannot be an engineer they don't I mean, you know we know lots of engineers in the country does everyone have to go to iit kanpur or iit bombay not in fact many of them go to iit Some managers in a finance, right? They're not doing any engineering, right? So at the there really is. So I think the question reframe to one is: Can you focus on the process for a child? The outcome is a byproduct. Okay, the outcome is a consequence of having done the process. The process is learning, an engagement with learning, a desire to enjoy the learning process, and there is no. question that you tend to do better if you enjoy what you're learning if you're doing something that you're miserable at it is very likely the outcome will also not be great but if you're doing something that you really enjoy you will do it more there's no question that practice does help the brain i mean performance is associated with repetitive practice as well but you are not going to do repetitive practice if you hate what you're doing so i think a sh- a mindset shift has to happen in our large indian parental mindset which is do not focus so much on the outcome mera beta engineer banega meri beti doctor banegi you know this is the goal you have already set the goal and they don't achieve that goal you're going to be miserable they are going to be miserable it's not worth it but if you say my child is going to learn and my child is going to excel at whatever they learn and i'm going to provide them the opportunities to excel in whatever they really enjoy it it takes away the security blanket of some notional outcome which is not guaranteed anyway right there's no guarantees that that outcome is going to happen but the process if you do and you believe in the process eventually some good outcome will come out of it i mean the child will do you know whatever they are happy at and now this is really hard to sort of fix because very often we still have people come to us for interviews and the question will be asked but what is the scope of doing a phd and i i can we cannot answer that question there's no i mean how do you measure scope right it's not some i mean we can say well if the person loves what they're doing they're going to have a enjoyable career but there are questions like how much how much are you going to earn are you going to be able to raise a family are you going to be able to do x are you going to be able to do and these are all very valid genuine concerns but they cannot become the sum total of everything they have to be sort of parked at a slightly lower level primary interest has to be focused on first so you talked about preventive uh, the reason i am focusing on that is we have a very large working population they have already gone through the education they've already gone through their schooling and now they are in a job maybe 
the early stages of the brain structure the growth of those neurons in the brain have had some impact how do you really cope up with this kind of a lower stress coping mechanism that they may they might have built with and what should they be doing because they have another 40 50 years to take care of their life right so essentially you're asking me is there a way to train your brain to become more resilient to become better at handling stress right yes there is like many things you can exercise and build a muscle much the same way you can train your brain to handle certain things better no question about it, right um the easiest answer is to see if you can remove the stress and in some cases it is doable in some cases not doable at all right so if it is a sustained stress and it's a severe sustained stress and you know that there is a way to avoid that severe stressor then one tries to set up a situation where one removes oneself from that stress if one can if it's a severe psychological or physical stress but you know that is a rare option and that's not something that's always available at all right so then what do you do when you have to live with the stress in a sense so in a sense the question is how do you get your mind to not focus on that stress non stop let's say that it could be for example a very terrible relationship in your work and but you cannot quit your job because at the end of the day that job is bringing money to the table and you support your family with that job so quitting the job is not an option uh, you are not able to change the environment you are not able to change the people around you but you have to now only thing that is in your control is modulating your response right so the first step is to try to ask how often the stress continues to impact you after the event is closed out so even if you have a nasty interaction with someone usually it's short lived 5 minutes 10 minutes but how much do you ruminate over it if you ruminate over it for 24 hours 48 hours 72 hours that event which is restricted to 10 minutes has become a 72 hour long event right so that's the first sort of thing you want to target you may not be able to bring it down from 72 hours to 1 hour and 10 minutes but you can start by saying i am going to find windows in which i can switch my mind off this event walk me through the process of rumination and how it affects the brain so the brain is an interesting structure it does something called pattern separation and pattern generalization now i'll tell you what pattern separation is okay so let's say i am an employee in a company and i go to a particular office and i am at the branch office head office and i have a very nasty interaction with my superior at this office and becomes a very stressful environment for me so now this is a pattern i associate with this environment i generally think that okay when i go to the head office i am going to have an unpleasant reaction now i am posted to a new office let's say in andheri okay so i am now no longer got to go to the head office i am going to the new andheri office i can pattern separate which would be the right thing to do and say ah oh, this is a new environment it's totally fresh it may be wonderful and if you pattern separate, separate successfully and it turns out to be a better environment you will not generalize the trauma of that environment to the new environment but more often than not what happens and this happens quite routinely is you pattern generalize mera pehla boss aisa hi tha ab ye dusra wala bhi waisa hi hoga right i'm giving you the the sort of the lingua franca of how we say it to each other are we this is how it was now it's going to be like this aisa hi hone wala hai right we say this why do we say this we are generalizing something that has happened in one context to a totally new context it turns out that there's a part of the brain called the hippocampus which is very involved in learning and memory which is essential for this kind of pattern separation like event and this part of the brain continues to make new neurons throughout life right and the more new neurons you make the better you are at pattern separate so in a sense think about it as a muscle right i mean your ability to lift a weight will be better if you have a good muscle so much the same way if your hippocampus is endowed with good healthy newborn neurons and nicely functioning networks you are likely to do pattern separation much more effectively so you pattern generalize to all situations all contexts all environments 
But if you pattern separate, so now what I'm trying to tell you is what you want to become, Swami, is a pattern separator, a really effective pattern separator. So, okay, if you have to do this in terms of how do you change your brain to become a better pattern separator, one of the things that we know that does better pattern separation is actually making more newborn neurons within the hippocampus. And what increases newborn neuron formation, and we know this from rats, we know this from mice, we know this from monkeys, we know this from birds, what actually increases the production of newborn neurons? Two, two things I'll tell you. Many things do, but, but two. One is learning. Learning something new. Okay, learning. The other is exercise. Voluntary exercise. Both of these two things, they help cognition and learning, but they also help in pattern separation, right? So in a sense, if we are to extrapolate, we don't know this is exactly true for humans, but we are extrapolating from data that we know in many other systems. I would say that amongst the most potent indicators of allowing resilience to come in is to learn something new, something that challenges your brain, or to exercise routinely, regularly, with a diversity of varied exercises that are enjoyed by you. So when uh, the growth of neurons happen, what happens to the brain and therefore your stress coping pathways and what, what happens to your own behavior and your ability to manage the right. environment? So these new neurons integrate into what are called stable networks in the hippocampus. They are born they migrate short distances, they send out dendrites, they send out their processes, they send out axons, and they inherently increase what's called plasticity, it's the ability to respond to new change, right? So it's a new change that's happening. The hippocampus is a top-down regulator of the stress hormone pathway. So what I was talking about before, cortisol, which is produced in your body when you are highly stressed. It's a cholesterol-derived hormone and your body makes a ton of it when you are under stress. Now, why does this matter? Let's take the example I told you. You had a bad fight with your boss. It lasted for 10 minutes. You are worrying about it one week later. You are in your body with cortisol for way longer hours than that actual event. And your body thinks you're under chronic, chronic stress, right? So you're actually under a lot of chronic stress. If you can switch it off effectively and quickly, you will terminate and reduce the time. The stress will still be stressful, but it will not be stressful for so long. And the hippocampus is actually one of the key structures in the brain that actually drives the top-down regulation of this pathway and switches off the stress response. Okay, okay. You also do a lot of study around antidepressants, and their impact on the on the brain is having antidepressants does it have a permanent impact or is it is it something that is probably temporary how does it affect the brain and today i see a lot of prescriptions of antidepressants and people taking antidepressants for stress coping mechanisms what do you see of that and the impact on the brain right so most currently prescribed antidepressants, hitting levels of monoamines, these are neurotransmitters, serotonin, norepinephrine, and to a certain degree, but a lesser extent, dopamine. But it's really serotonin and norepinephrine. They do this by blocking the reuptake of this neurotransmitter back into the presynaptic neuron. So what you end up doing is essentially think about it like this. You don't have enough serotonin or norepinephrine or it's not working normally. That's a very loose-handed way of saying what might be going wrong in depression certainly doesn't tell you the whole story. But certainly these pathways seem to be dysfunctional in depressed individuals. What you're doing is artificially going in and allowing more serotonin and norepinephrine to accumulate in the brain. You can do this in other ways besides doing it with drugs. You can do it with cognitive behavior therapy, which also, by the way, is highly effective at the milder scale of depression. You can do this with exercise, which will also increase serotonin and norepinephrine in the brain. And certainly at the milder end, when we're talking about mild dysthymia or at the milder end, it's these other interventions that could be very, very effective, right? But when you're talking about somebody who has to then visit a psychiatrist, they will likely prescribe them drugs if they believe that this is a sustained 
long lasting pattern that is disrupting their ability to do normal functioning of their life and if they have suicidal ideation or they are incapable of really performing their basic normal functioning in life and um they will prescribe this but they will also likely prescribe behavior therapy they will suggest a bunch of things and the person will do that for a period of time and certainly what antidepressants do create an effective change in the brain um it really depends on what the environment is like as well i mean if you've been able to give the person either effective behavioral so using cognitive behavior therapy you've given the person the tools they need to cope they may be able to handle the environment better or for whatever reason the environment has changed to a certain degree they may be able to show recovery but very often are recurring disorders with recurring episodes of depression which often last for longish periods of time and the person may go on off and antidepressants off and on for long stretches and that's not unheard of and that happens quite commonly you talked about the importance of learning how do you do continuous learning constantly reading people's papers and reading interesting discoveries i mean job by definition is really learning new things every single day right so i mean that's one of the things i love the most about what i do which is that i get to um, read about exciting studies which are being made all over the world about the brain and it's not just about the neurocircuitry of emotion i'm interested in you know broad neuroscience and broad biology so reading about those discoveries and learning about them and you know reading the publications i mean that's a form of learning but i like to push myself out of my comfort zone right i like to learn things that i don't think i would be able to do so across the pandemic i took a acrylic oil painting course and i did I two do. sessions of 6 6 weeks and i don't know how to paint okay so i'm i it's all like i've held a brush and i know how to do acrylic painting and i don't know any of it but i did these online courses because what we also know from research from so many groups over the world is that if you keep repeating and doing the things that you are already good at and you you know you will just get better at them yes but it's not really challenging you i mean it really doesn't challenge you because you're defaulting to things that you can do easily so does actually, it affect the uh, br- does it affect the brain in any way when you see do, do something like an acrylic painting uh what happens to the brain so the neurons new neurons get generated is it you know i don't know if new neurons got generated in my brain when i was doing <laughs> acrylic painting but i no. can tell, i can tell you that it was a remarkable stress buster it really was cuz for the 45 minutes i was listening to my instructor telling me okay now mix this paint with titanium white color mix this paint with a sienna brown it was like therapy because i was sitting and mixing colors and i was when i was painting i wasn't thinking about anything else my mind was utterly present in that moment with that i was present right and that that's in some sense that's what they talk about mindful meditation as well which is being present in that moment and not allowing so i found it remarkably wonderful i don't know what i learned or i enjoy painting very much and i will take another class happily any time but i would say you know learning a new mus- musical instrument learning or taking on a new hobby learning a new language oh my god that's a serious challenge i mean you really stretch yourself when you do things like that right learning something new something that you haven't done i mean people have been making you know during the pandemic people have been baking all kinds of things and people have been cooking and sending food to and friends and people have been doing so many different things right so sometimes it's about learning a new skill maybe it's embroidery maybe it's crochet maybe it's music you pick up a new instrument variety of things but i would say pushing the boundaries to go outside of your comfort zone is critical it cannot be just within your comfort zone and if your comfort zone is a little too narrow push the boundaries a little bit further push yourself out so for example let's say you want to learn how to dance right now that requires motor movements and muscle movements that your body is not used to making it will require a whole reorientation of your sort of neural circuitry to allow you to become adept at dance and that's pushing your circuits to do something quite different so i think that key part is not just learning but what you are learning and whether you are really challenging yourself by pushing yourself out of your comfort zone great 
what do you th- how do you see neuroscience changing over the next decade or more what what do you think are going to be the key trends you are seeing in neuroscience and how will it impact the research that you do how will it impact society at large so i'll start by saying that in the last 20 years we are witnessing a huge revolution in neuroscience i mean the kind of so let's put it this way are is it because we are asking questions that have never been asked by anybody before no not really okay many times the questions have been there for a long time we just didn't have the tools to ask them really effectively we were sort of hamstrung on the kind of tools and technology we had to really probe the brain in the last 20 years the sort of tools and technology that has come to play we have tools that allow us to go in and actually switch on a population of neurons we have tools that allow us to switch off a population of neurons we have tools that allow us to say okay i'm very interested in a pathway that goes from the ventral hippocampus to the basolateral amygdala i just want to activate or inhibit this pathway and see what it does to behavior see what it does to function now where are the impact where is the impact of this and when is it going to translate for people the the lay person who's waiting to see the impact come in right i think it's going to be huge in the next 15 20 30 years i'll give you an example now let's say spinal cord injury right very common happens often in young people who have an accident even someone who's driving a motorcycle you get paralyzed because the spinal cord is resected or injured really badly there's nothing wrong with the brain nothing wrong with the muscles just that the wires in a sense the communication pathway that connects are gone so you can't control the individual is paralyzed at the prime window of their life we are we don't have therapies for this currently i mean we have all sorts of ideas and potential things in the pipeline but nothing that's yet led to a therapeutic breakthrough right but already in the basic neuroscience realm we have seen that there are ways to bypass this so that you can actually control the neurons in the spinal cord that directly regulate the muscles and so despite a spinal resection you can see the mouse start walking again even start doing movement again now this is huge this is mind blowing right because this has not happened before so the kind of therapeutic breakthroughs that are happening in basic neuroscience will take some time to translate but they are unprecedented and they are immensely exciting and i hope that as a whole the public continues to be supportive of basic research because it takes time these things require patience they are not going to be wave a wand and fix them and there's so much we still don't understand about the brain and so i'm immensely hopeful terribly optimistic and i would say to young people who are thinking about both a career as well as thinking about the outcomes they will see in their life span i would say engage with neuroscience if you want to be a neuroscientist do it this is the time to be a neuroscientist it's one of the most exciting fields and i mean there isn't a day that goes by where you're not you don't have an oh wow moment and you you know li- listening to something or you're reading something and you're just your mind is blown because you're thinking that is a pretty phenomenal finding right and that is a addictive state of mind to have to have the sort of opportunity to see cutting edge science and i and i really hope there are people who will think about neuroscience as a career but let's say you don't even think about neuroscience as a career i would say engage with there's so much popular information out there which the neuroscientist neuroscience science community has put out there either through popular reading or through books by oliver sacks book books by many others engage with them because you will in the next 30 years definitely start seeing incredible things showing up i'm not even talking about machine brain machine interface right that is another people who are doing ai and computer science and are cross talking to people in the neuroscience science community brain machine interface is also going to be a, a remarkable area in which we will see applications rolling out um, out into the market out into the commonplace over a period short period of time great 
I want to end this conversation with a question which I normally ask my guests. If you were to write a letter to your to a 10 year old self to yourself today what would be the three pieces of advice you would give her i would say to my 10 year old version of myself don't ever let anybody else decision on your dreams that would be the first one two always remember to enjoy learning no matter where it comes from because that is lifelong and is is positively the most rewarding will help you cope with whatever comes your way in your life and take your work seriously but don't take yourself seriously so enjoy your work take it seriously but always have a sense of humor to be able to laugh at situations that arise and and don't take yourself too seriously thanks a lot professor brita vaidya it was really brilliant talking to you i really learned a lot of stuff about the brain the kind of emotions that the brain creates with its neuro circuitry and i really enjoyed and i learned a lot through this conversation thanks a lot for your time thank you swami i thoroughly enjoyed talking to you too and you took me to many sort of ideas and places and how does one take uh, you know insights that come from a laboratory environment to the real life actual real world scenario and i enjoyed it very much too thanks a lot